So my name is Jake Vanderplas. I'm a uh, grad student in astronomy at um, University of Washington. And um, I'm going to talk about scikit-learn, which is uh, an extension of some of the SciPy and NumPy utilities that's been developed in the last several years um, to do machine learning in Python. Um, and so it's a, it's a very cool tool. I, I got involved because I was doing some, some machine learning and some data analysis for my astronomical research. And there were some tools that I need, uh, in particular neighbors uh, or tree-based neighbor searches, things like that, that I couldn't find in the, um, in the tools that were available. Uh, there's the KD tree in SciPy, but it, I was looking at high dimensional stuff, so the KD tree didn't scale. So I, I wrote a ball tree code um, that accomplished my problem, and then I figured since I spent so much time on that, I might as well make it useful to other people. So I um, got in touch with the people who had just started scikit-learn at that point and um, submitted my code, and from that they, uh, they have drawn me in, and now I spend way too much time <laughs> working on this package, but it's great. So if you go to, uh, I don't know if you can see the URL up there, but it's um, scikit-learn.org. And you can, um, you can see <coughs> everything, everything that's there. I just want to real quick show you a few features of the website before we move on into the other stuff. If you click on the examples menu up top, this is very similar to matplotlib. We have a whole gallery of machine learning examples. So all of this is done on um, various data sets, various machine learning algorithms. And if you, if you want to learn about machine learning, this is a great place to just uh, click around and, and see what you can find. Um, for today's tutorial, I, I, made a, I made my own branch of this website with some added tutorial stuff. This will be, um, be merged into the main documentation sometime in the next few weeks. But the, uh, the web address is jakevdp.github.com. I don't know, maybe I can write that in. And can I make this bigger? There we go. So that's, that's the web address right there. And if you, if you have that, you can, um, you'll end up on this main page right here. Scroll down to the second section, and section 2.3 is scikit-learn and astronomical data. Click on that, and you'll be on, on this page right here. So, there's a lot of material in this tutorial. Um, I don't think we'll have time to get through all of it today. Um, but I'm thinking we'll probably go through section t the, the first section here, which, well, set up an inspiration. I, I think you have all that um, already if you, had your little, if you had your USB key. We'll go through the second section on general machine learning concepts, um, and then skip through this practical advice thing. You can look at that yourself. And then there are a few exercise, exercises later that use astronomical data to uh, display how to use some of this machine learning technology. So why don't we start? If you click on, that says inspiration. I think it is meant to say installation. <laughs> but <laughs> I still need to, to spell check all this or read through it. So if, if you don't have um, scikit-learn installed on your machine, then um, should probably do that right now. If you have easy install, it's on there. Or pip, it's on there. If you use the little um, the little memory stick, you should have scikit-learn. So you can check this by opening an IPython whoops IPython thing and click. Um, let me make this a little smaller. Import sklearn. So that's the, the head namespace for scikit-learn, sklearn. So we'll, we'll be using a lot of that sort of stuff. So if, does everybody have that installed? We're going to be doing a lot of really interactive things here. Everyone's good on that? Cool. So the, the other thing you need is, the, um, is some data files from this tutorial. If you got your little um, USB stick, it's in I copied this to pi data on my desktop. If you're in that, in that uh, folder from the USB stick, just use CD astronomy, 
And you should have this uh, file here with a few different things. So we have uh, data. It's kind of hard to read here, isn't it? Let me see if I can make this smaller. Is there a web address for any of that stuff if you don't have the USB stick? Or yeah, I'll, I'll, I can show you that. If you don't have the USB stick, you can um, follow the example here. Just do, if you have git, you can git clone this repo. Yeah, you can git clone that repo, and if once you have the data, there's uh, there's a file data, which this has some of the astronomical data that we'll be working with. There's a uh, file solutions, and this is the uh, completed exercises, the you know the the, uh, the teacher's answer key, and then in skeletons, there's some of there's some code that we'll be filling in along the way to to do some of these examples. This is everyone. Managing to find that? Yeah? Okay, cool. So, this is, uh, this first page just has a bunch about how to, how to download the data sets and things like that. If you got it off the USB key, then you already have the data sets there. So let's go to the next section, general concepts. So the idea with with machine learning and art artificial intelligence is what you're trying to do is um, write programs that have, they have tunable parameters um, and that, and that you, the, in these programs, these tunable parameters are adjusted to fit your data in the best way possible. So uh, uh, one way you can think about this, uh, a common thing that you might want to do is if you have a collection of points that you know are of two different categories, you want to figure out a way to divide them. So, so that if you have, um, so this, this would be a training sample where you know this is all class one, this is class two. And if you throw a new point at it, a new observation, and it lands somewhere in the space, you want to be able to predict whether that point is in class one or class two. So this is a really simplistic example, but um, as the, as the data sets grow large, the, the kind of things this might be, um, you know, maybe you're, you're looking at web pages and your attributes are the word counts on those web pages and your classes, as you're trying to, you're trying to classify this web page as a personal blog or a news source or you know, some other classification that you're interested in learning about. There, there are all sorts of situations where this this general framework can be, can be extended to some really interesting problems. So this is, uh, a, a lot of times for these examples, we'll, we'll work in really um, simple spaces, just 2D, because we can, we can plot that up and show these bounding lines. So in case you're, you're wondering, this is a, um, a support vector machine that did this classification. And all these plots in here are linked to source code. So if you click on it, um, this page that it brings you to will actually show you the source code that was used to, to create that data, to fit that data, and then to plot it. So that's a, a useful thing in this tutorial. Um, actually, throughout the scikit-learn documentation website, any plot that you see, you can click on, and it'll tell you how it's made. So it's, it's pretty useful for, for learning the tools. So the question is, given if, if you have this data, how do you use scikit-learn to to learn some things, to learn the, these parameters. So we're going we're gonna to talk about a few different things. Um, we need to talk about how to turn raw data into numerical arrays. Because if you have things like text data, we, you, you, can't, you can't do any machine learning on it until you've turned that into, into numbers that the algorithms can understand. We'll talk about um, supervised learning. We'll talk about unsupervised learning and the difference between those two. Um, and then we'll talk about some concepts of uh, overfitting and some, some more detailed things. So let's move on to this section right here. We have um, features and feature extraction. So in, in scikit-learn, the um, data model is that you basically, for, for any data, you have an array x. So um, I'm going to do some random points here. Uh, let's make it 
100 by 4. So let's So if we have an array that's 100 points by 4 point, or 100, 100 by 4, what we have in, in scikit-learn, this represents 100 points in four dimensions. So the, the first dimension always tells you how many samples you have. So it might be in our, what we were talking about before, it might be how many web pages you have, or how many stars you're looking at, or how many different people's faces you're looking at. And the second dimension um, indicates the number of features that you have. So any, any sort of observed feature that you have. So as you're using scikit-learn, keep that in mind that if you, can, if you can get a data set into the form where it's n features by n points, sorry, n samples by n features, then you can use these machine learning algor algorithms. So as an example of this, let's use the um, one data set that's common for this sort of thing is the uh, IRIS data set. So essentially, we've, there's this data set that's out there that um, some scientists took a look at some irises, wild irises out in the forest, and measured some features of these irises. So they have the, the sepal length, the sepal width, the petal length, and the petal width. So for each of, these, um, each of these four categories, there's a real numbered value, which is length in centimeters. And then the classes of these objects are um, three, different, um, three different species, basically. So the, the thing we want to ask is, given a measurement of these features of this flower, can we classify the flower that we're looking at into one of these three um, into one of these three species. So we have some ex example code up here, and uh, I guess this would have been better as an IPython notebook. Huh? I should have should have gotten on the ball yeah, on that. Oh, great! Okay, so so what, one useful thing we have in Scikit-Learn is a number of data set loaders. So you always need data in order to, uh, to do this sort of stuff, but data is big, so we don't want to ship it with, with the source code. So instead, we have, um, we have data set loaders. So if I import data sets and then do a tab complete, we can see all the data sets we have. There's um, all the ones that start with fetch are data sets. So let's do fetch tab complete. 20 news groups. This is basically uh, cat word data from different news groups with uh, classifications based on the word on the news groups. Um, Olivetti face faces is the um, is a, ho a whole bunch of images of faces that can be used for facial recognition. Um, yeah, there's several other data sets in there, so you can explore that. But we're going to do um, data sets dot load iris and um, let's call this data oops I gotta put an equals there don't I so this loads the iris data sets and we can type data dot shape and see oh shoot it's a bunch object I forgot about that so we want to do x equals data dot x oh man I should just look at my uh, look at my crib notes down here to make sure I have this right. So um, data, yeah, so we want x equals data dot data, and y equals data dot targets. Doesn't have targets. Sorry about this, guys. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so now we can look at um, x dot shape, and we see that x dot shape is 150 comma four. So that means that we're looking at um, 150 samples with four different features each. So those are those those four different measurements that we were looking at. Now, when you're saying samples, I mean, I'm picturing rows, but I, when I think of a sample, I think of a number of things. Mm. Do you mean really 150 rows? Yeah, it's, a, it's 150 rows, and each row is um, associated with a single object, in this case, a single flower. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And 
look for the sample through that flag. Yeah, so. that's right. And the features are the four uh, four dimensions of, of that have been measured for that flower. And if we look at y dot shape, um, we see that that's 150 right there. So we basically have one number for each um, for each each uh, sample. <laughs> and so these are the if we print. Whoa, where did my where did my thing go? If we print y, we see that these um, these classifications are, are basically a zero, a one, or a two. So this is the um, this is showing us the uh, the species of the training set. Yeah, so we can do, let's do it this way. So iris equals datasets.load iris. Maybe x equals iris.data. y equals iris.target. So looking back at this, yeah, if we look at um, x0, the first row of the array, we see that <coughs> it's just an array of values. So in this case, the, I guess the sepal length is 5 centimeters, the sepal width is 3.5 centimeters, etc. The other thing we have here is target. iris.target underscore names. This shows us, um, so for each of these target values, for each of these target values, they are associated with uh, a species, so you have the species names there. So let's think about how we can, um, Okay, so did everybody get that get that iris data set loaded up? So if we want to, we can. Um, I'm just kind of going on the <laughs> on the fly here, but if we want to, we can. Oh yeah. Great. Excellent. Magic. <laughs> so if we um, let's. Let's scatter two of these just to just to see um, what these look like. We're going to scatter the, the first column of the matrix with the second column of the matrix. And let's make the color equal to that Y right there. And we'll take a look at what the data looks like. So this is the kind of data that we have. This is two out of the four dimensions of what we're looking at. So we can look at two of our four dimensions here, and um, we see, are you guys ready to look at the plot? Yeah. Let's move that over here. And what we see is that the, uh, they're definitely, they're definitely the, the features group together in a certain way, right? We, these, these blue points right here over in this part of the space, the red and the green points are a little closer together, but you might see that those we might expect that the other measurements would help us separate these out a little more. So what, what machine learning is trying to do is basically use those features and do this sort of thing in an automated way. If you were a, a person looking at this data, you might draw a line right here and say everything north of there is, is a blue point, or uh, I can't remember which species that, that's part of right now. Um, but for machine learning, we want, we want the code to do that automatically. We don't want to have to look at plots of every single dimension. We want this to, to happen automatically. So let's do a little aside here and um, talk about, in this case, this was, these were categorical, categorical features. Or th these were, um, what do I call it? These, these were real numbered features. So we have a measurement for each category, for each feature. You might also, in some places, have um, categorical features. So, for example, if you measure that the color is purple, blue, or red, you don't have a real number, a continuous variable for that, but you just have categorical feature. So, in that case, what you 
what you might do if you wanted to do a machine learning algorithm on that data is you look at, you'd have these first four um, measurements that we had before, but you'd also add maybe a fourth dimension that's one if the color's purple and zero otherwise. Zoom in here. And you, you could add a, uh, you know, a fifth dimension that does the same thing for blue or a sixth dimension that does the same thing for red. So, for example, if, if you have these categorical features, that's one way you could divide it up. Another way you could divide it up is to do, have purple be zero, red be one, and blue be two, or something like that in a, in a single dimension. And the, the way you decide to do that kind of de depends on the problem and what, what you're expecting to get out. So it takes, it's a little bit of art. It's not just uh, completely a science doing machine learning. So there's also, um, sometimes you might want to extract features from unstructured data. So an example of that would be things like uh, a text document. So how do you go from a text document to some number of vectors that you can plug into a machine learning algorithm? There are, uh, there are a few ways you can do this. If you, you can um, count the frequency of each pair of words. So, um, if you, if you have a, a text document about the White House, there might be the pair, the president, all over the place. So each time you see the, the pair of words, the president, you make that a feature and count how many times that happens. Um, that's the, called this, it's the so-called bag of words way of doing it. Um, so there, there are tools in scikit-learn for doing this sort of stuff. The, the documentation for the feature extraction tools is not quite as good as the rest of the package, but that's being, um, that's being worked on right now. So if you have text data, you can, you can work with that. And there's actually some good tutorials online for how to work with text data. So if you're working with image data, um, for example, if you have a whole bunch of pictures of people and you want to try a machine learning algorithm to identify those faces, um, one way to do it is to rescale all the images to a fixed size. So you have basically a certain number of pixels per image. And you can take all the raw pixel values as a vector. So you have a, a 100 by 100 image, and that becomes 10,000 pixels. And then you have a, um, a value for each of those pixels. So in that case, you would have 10,000 dimensional data. And you're starting to get very high, high dimensions. Um, you can do more sophisticated things, like take a, take a transform, a wavelet transform, something like that. Um, you can, there are other things on here. I, I won't talk all the way through them, but there, there are several different ways to, um, to do Im to, to data extraction on, on images. Um, you can do a similar type of thing for sounds. You can... Um, Sounds, you basically resample to a common grid and you have a, a floating point value for each of those, each of those areas. So anyway, you can, you can do machine learning on, on basically any type of data. So that's what we're trying to say here. And um, scikit-learn has tools available that'll help you do all of that. So once you have this data, essentially what, what you're doing is you're taking your, your input, whether it's figures or text, documents, images, whatever. You translate that in some way into feature vectors. So for each, for each sample, for each object that you're um, interested in, you have a set of numbers. And you also have labels for this training data. And you use your machine lear learning algor algorithm, put those together, and you come up with a predictive model. So you can think of this model as like a, a Python object. And that's the way scikit-learn implements it. And then if you, if you have a new sample, so you're looking, you download a web page and you're asked, you want your machine learning algorithm to tell you what type of web page is it, what is it talking about. You apply the same transform to get the feature vector out of that. You plug this feature vector into the predictive model and the predictive model has, um, has a tool or has a, a method that'll get you your expected label. So that's basically the, the workflow of a supervised machine learning problem. I'm going to skip some stuff here and show you that if you, um, in scikit-learn, there's a certain syntax to do all of this stuff. So basically, in, um, in uh, 
there's a there's a vectorizer method, and I'll I'll show you a little bit about that. That'll translate training text into feature vectors. You have a classifier, and you call the fit method on the the data and the labels, and you get a predictive model. You use the same vectorizer to get a feature vector out of your um, new document, and then you call the predict method to get the new label out. So that's kind of the, the workflow of scikit-learn. And let me go back up here. So anyway, the, the nice thing about that is that there are, there are hundreds, literally hundreds of these learning algor algorithms available in the package, and they all have pretty much that same interface. So um, I've talked to people who said, I don't know anything about machine learning. What do I do? And I've, my, my main advice is usually to uh, find a data set and figure out the syntax and then just throw your data at a few of these classifiers and see what they do. And if one of them seems to work, you know, you plot something up and one of them seems to work, then you can go to the documentation and learn about what's going on there. So it's a, a kind of a backward approach. You don't need to do all the theory, uh, but the theory is good too, so we have all that in the documentation. Um, but we want this to be a tool that people can just play around with and, and learn machine learning. So, um, let's see, where are we here? Oh yeah, so this, um, one other thing about these labels. The labels can sometimes be categorical features, so things like uh, what species of iris it is. Things, the labels can also be, um, be floating point values. So if we're looking at categorical features, we're talking about classification, which is a, a type of type of machine learning problem. If we're looking at continuous values, we want to do something, we want to do, um, it's called regression. So for example, one of the exercises later on is uh, regression applied to what we call photometric redshifts. So in, in astronomy, we look, at, we look at galaxies and we want to know how far away they are. And that, that distance to those galaxies is correlated with the, the redshift, basically the amount that the universe has expanded while that light has been traveling to us. So you can use these observations of galaxies and try to ask what, what is the redshift? And this is a really common problem in astronomy and we, um, it's, it's something that's really, really important for some of these upcoming surveys is finding how far away these galaxies are so you can do cosmology, learn about things like dark matter and dark energy. So this is, this is stuff that, that people are using in practice. So um, let's do a, a quick classification example. So we have our, um, our data here, and I'm going to close that. We loaded our iris data. We have uh, x, which is uh, 150 by 4. We have y, which, which is length 150. And we're going to use something called the, um, the linear SVC. So this is a a linear su support vector machine classifier. So support vector machines are, are um, a technique that have been really, really powerful in machine learning. And um, you, can do, you can do basic linear models and you can get more complicated from that. So the, the way we do that is we do from sklearn.svm import linear SVC. So linear SVC is our class that um, our class that, that implements this method. So, um, oh yeah, then we need to instantiate this. So we have CLF for classifier equals linear SVC, open close parentheses. So we instantiate this class and we have this classifier instance right here. So if you type CLF, you see what it is. It's a linear support vector classifier model. It has these certain parameters. The C, that constant, is, is 1.0. That's kind of a weight uh, that you can adjust to, to how, how closely you fit points. You have um, a tolerance in your, in your convergence down at the bottom. You, you have certain scalings. You can choose different penalty terms. You can choose different parameters to fit. So there's a whole host of things in there. And if you're, if you're curious about what all these are, you can, in your IPython shell, type linear SVC question mark, and the, the doc strings are pretty good. So, 
This is a linear kernel SVC. You have all the parameters there. Um, so in general, that'll tell you how to go on. So we have our, our classifier there. but So the classifier has not been trained yet. We, we have this nice classifier, but we haven't thrown any data at it yet. So the way that we throw data at the classifier is do clf.fit x comma y. So x is our um, x is our input data, y are the labels, and we end up with a fit classifier. So um, if we type clf in this case, co let's look at the coefficients. Uh, I hate when I do that. These are the uh, this is basically the internal data model that it is generated in that fit. Yeah, it's a great question. I think the, uh, so underscore means private, usually. Yeah, and normally at the beginning, not the end. Yeah. So when you see a variable named like that, and you know, it's kind of walking in, it's like, hey, can you see that? Yeah. So this is something that you, uh, that's a good good question. Maybe we, sh we need to think about the, uh, the implementation details there. But uh, I think the, uh, the underscore at the end usually means something that was fit by the model. And, ah. um, so it's not something that it's not something that you necessarily need to look at because um, you're not gonna you're not gonna take that array and do anything with it, but sometimes it's just nice to look at. So they're they're the parameters fit by the model that are used in the in the classification later on. So this is just to show you that these are the coefficients that we we put in those 150 data points and it trained and and created this list of coefficients and these coefficients are what are used to do the um, to do the the classification later on so let's say we um, have a new point we don't know what the classification is so we'll just do a 2d array X new dot shape whoops sorry X new equals numpy dot ev array X new. So there it is. There's our data, and we want it to be a, a two-dimensional array, even though it's a single point, because this this tells us that we have one point in four dimensions. So if we're if we're curious what the classification is of that new point based on this classifier, um, we do clf dot predict x new, and then it tells us zero. So the um, this is a, a point type zero. So let's see, iris.target names. So that's uh, the species Satotha. So th this is just a simple, simple linear classifier that did, did something very similar to what I showed you before. It, you know, we plot up and we draw a little line and we say this fits there, that fits there. This um, internally, that, that's what happened with this learning mechanism. Okay, so here's another, uh, you, might, you might be interested um, when you're doing this sort of thing, rather than just getting out a specific classification value, you might want to get a, um, an idea of what the probability is of these certain classifications. And I'm not gonna type this one out, it's, uh, I'm just gonna go through it, but you can use some, another algorithm, logistic regression. Um, there's several other algorithms that behave this way as well, where when you do your, you do your fit to the data, and you get out your parameters, and then you have a, uh, you can predict the probability. Instead of just predicting the label, you do predict prob, and you um, get out the, for this value, you get out basically that it's 90% probable that it's the first one, it's 9% the second one, and 1% uh, one part and ten to the fifth, the third one. So, you can get out. You can get out a probab probabilistic uh, classification as well. So, so just uh, in case you want to try some of these out, here's uh, several different classifiers that you can use. There's logistic re regression. There's support vector machines. Um, several different types. There's the um, stochastic gradient descent classifier. Neighbors classifier. Um, Gaussian naive Bayes, so several things like that. 
And you can imagine um, using classifiers in, in email classification, language identification, news articles, categorize, categorization, um, yeah, all, all these different things. Looking at, at face verification in pictures, like is this picture a face, is it not? Um, and what we're going to talk about, astronomical sources, you can do classification as well. So we mentioned that um, regression is, uh, is like classification, except instead of learning these categorical features, you're learning um, some sort of floating point value. There's something between, between 0 and 1 inclusive, perhaps. And so there are, there are several uh, regression models listed here. So you can, you can try some of those out if you're, if you're interested. Um, so let's talk real briefly about unsupervised learning now. So you notice that what we had before was we, uh, we, took our, we took our data, we turned them into vectors, we used the machine learning algorithm with the labels to fit, but in unsupervised learning we don't have any labels. So the idea here is that you have, maybe you have a bunch of observations, but you don't know what they are, and you just want to get a better idea of, a better idea of what the structure of the data is. So for example, with, uh, with astronomical spectra, we take we take images of maybe 100,000 points, and we have, we have a whole bunch of observations of each of those, and we're curious, what's, what's the relationship between all these? We don't necessarily know, if we don't, if we don't use any physical intuition to know what these points are, how can we learn about the relationships? And this is an unsupervised learning problem. So you have feature vectors, you get the predictive model, and with, with the new, when you put a new, um, a new point in, do the same thing, feature vectors, put it through the predictive model, and you get some sort of likelihood or clustering or better representation, lower dimensional representation, something like that. So this is, this is unsupervised learning. The other stuff we were doing was supervised learning. So it's just another, uh, another paradigm of, um, of machine learning. So one uh, one really common way of doing unsupervised learning is principal component analysis. So, um, yeah, why don't we do this? So if we do from sklearn import, sklearn.pca import pca, oh, what did I do wrong? Decomposition. <laughs> It's a, the same data set, yeah. So again, we have our, these are our, this is our iris data set. So before we, we plotted just basically two dimensions of this and we didn't, we didn't take into account the other two dimensions. Um, but with PCA, we can, we can project it down so that we can look at all the, uh, all the information. So PCA equals, let's, Let's fit this with uh, two components and we'll whiten it, which means, which means we're basically uh, moving all the data to the same scale. And just as before, we do pca.fit x. Um, but this time, remember, we don't put in the y value because this is unsupervised, so we don't know what the cate categories are. Um, and PCA, the x new equals PCA dot, sorry, to y equals P PCA dot transform x. So we're, we're transforming, we, f we fit on the data x and we're transforming on the same data. And I need to type equals. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Need our. We need our. We need our um, instantiated object, which is lowers case PCA. So now, if we look at y dot shape. Yeah. So the. This is um, if we look at this model right here. Basically, the the fit is taking our data, putting it through the algorithm, and getting a predictive model. And the transform is taking our data and turning it into this new representation right here. 
So you can do that, you can do that transform with um, a new feature into the new representation or a, a, new, a new set of data or you can do that transform with the original data you trained on and you get this new representation. And in our case, the, uh, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, so our, our original data is, is in four dimensions, and our next, this data is in two dimensions, because we chose, um, up here, we chose n components as two, oh, okay. yeah. So this is nice, right, because we, we can't really do a four-dimensional scatter plot, but we can do a two-dimensional scatter plot. So let's do um, scatter y colon zero, y colon 1, and our color is the lowercase y, which is our, our classifications. Okay, so we're, we're good to go? Okay. So if we do scatter y, again, colon, comma, 0, y colon, comma, 1, and then our color is y right here, then we see that <clears throat> this is the two-dimensional projection of the data, taking into account, taking into account all the dimensions, and then asking for, in an unsupervised manner, what's the best projection. So this is interesting because we, we clearly see that these blue points are, are completely different than the other ones. And unlike our other, our other plot of this, it does a little better job of separating out the red and the green points, right? So this is useful because you can imagine um, you know, going from four dimensions to two dimensions is not the most useful thing, but imagine if you had a thousand dimensions and you wanted to visualize the relationships between the data. That'd be difficult, but you could project down to two or three dimensions and see these sorts of relationships. The other way this is useful, um, sometimes people use it um, to speed up routines. So if you have something like, say, a text document that you're, you're breaking up and you end up with a million features, um, your machine learning algorithm might not scale very well to a million features. Some of these scale as n squared or n cubed, so it's, it's difficult. But if you can, if you can reduce that dimensionality, keeping the most interesting data, then you end up with something that will run a lot faster. So that's how this can be useful. So that's unsupervised learning. Um, we went through all that. That's that same plot, I think. Yeah, pretty close. Different colors, but same. Yeah, that's a good question. So maybe one way of thinking about it is um, if, if you're reading White House documents, then you know that um, you know that in, in any sentence that the word president president shows up then probably the name Obama is going to show up as well. So if, you, if, you, if you're just looking for President and Obama, and those are your two features, they'll probably be really correlated. If you plot the occurrences of President versus the occurrences of Obama, it'll be this nice big line. So what that's telling you is that the, the second feature doesn't tell you very much about that sentence. So you have these two features you're, you're measuring, and both of them pretty much tell you if the sentence is talking about the President. So what the dimensionality reduction does is it, um, it can look for those sorts of correlations and remove the unimportant points. So in the case of PCA, if you, had a, if you plotted a president, uh, the occurrence of President and the occurrence of Obama, you'd have this nice straight line. What PCA would do is it would say, um, well, it's, it's not this direction that's most important or this direction, it's this combination that's most important. So it would, take that, that 1D thing and throw out everything else, and then you reduce your data set size. So that's, that's kind of the, does that make sense? Yeah. So there, you're essentially removing correlations that aren't adding any information to your classification. Yeah, this is actually in the, this is in the um, scikit-learn documentation. So we have a, a script here, and this is part of our example gallery. So I just uh, embedded that in. That might be a little different than the notebook style. So, yeah, I talked about some of this stuff. Um, another dimensionality that you, reduction thing that you can do is, um, or not, not dimensionality reduction, but another 
unsupervised learning method that you can do is clustering. So for example, we know, um, looking at this, because, because we've put our colors here telling us which one of these is which, um, we kind of know where the clusters of points are. We know this is here, this is here, this is here. But if, we, if this were higher dimensional data, if we weren't able to plot it like this, you might wonder if you could automatically find the fact that these points cluster together and they're separated from the rest. So that's another unsupervised learning technique. And um, one of the more common ways to do this is with um, k-means. So k-means is an algorithm that does this sort of thing. And I'm actually just going to uh, let me close this. Just for the sake of time, I'm going to turn on um, doc test mode right here. Oh, I didn't. Uh, yeah, so X PCA up there, I called called that Y. So let's do that, and then we can um, paste all this in again. And so what we're doing here is we're calling a um, just like before we import something called K means. This is our classifier object. Um, we just initialize the random state here because K means depends on. Uh, it uses randomness in its, um, in its algorithm. And then uh, we define our k-means classifier object. And then we actually did the definition and the fit all at the same time right here. So what I did was I actually um, I trained this k-means classifier on the output of our, last, of our last unsupervised learning thing. So this was the, the PCA projection, the two-dimensional projection of our data. Um, and now if we want to, oh, where did I, where does this plot 2D come from? So yeah, let's just, uh, let's scatter again. Um, oh yeah, so here, here, this is what I'm looking for. K-means dot um, labels. That's, a, that's a, a length 150 vector. So that, this is the labels that were, were given to us by this unsupervised k-means um, algorithm. So just as before, we can scatter our xpca colon 0, xpca colon 1, c equals our k-means dot labels. And this is what we end up with. So let's see if I can. What we saw before when, when we looked at the actual labels was, oh, I won't need to. Did I ruin that? Yeah. I'm trying to get two different figures here. I'll get it eventually. There we go. So on one side, we see our, our k-means labels. So this is what, this is what k-means thought our points were without, without any indication, without any training data on what the categorizations were. And then on this side was our actual categorizations that we know. So you can see that, uh, as you might expect, k-means does pretty well when things are very well separated. But when you have two different clumps that kind of mesh together, you, you don't necessarily get that. That's because this, is a, this was an unsupervised method, just basically looking, looking at this data. It knew nothing about the intrinsic classification. And so, you told it to look for three. I, I told it to look for three, so too. Really that's yeah, yeah. So that, that's another thing. You can, you can tell it to look for however many we want. So a lot of these things have, have tunable parameters that you have to decide how, how you're going to set. So. It takes a while, but <laughs> but you can how you can figure out how much what? Yeah, so second learn he, he was asking about hyperparameter selection, and that's the term for choosing like for for instance how many clusters you're looking for or uh, how many dimensions you're projecting to. Um, we're we're working on that right now on getting some good hyperparameter selection tools, but in Scikit-Learn right now, there's not much um, built in. 
there's, there's a little bit of stuff on cross-validation, but it's not very mature yet. So a lot of that you, you end up having to do yourself. So this is just a, a list of some of the unsupervised learning methods that are available there as well. So you can look through that on your own time if you'd like. And um, so this one's fun. This is, this is something that if you go to, if you're on this page and you click this link, there's this little script. It's a, it's a little matplotlib GUI that um, does SVM classification. So you can click, if you go back, back, it's this little link right here under 2324. You click that and then um, you can download this file. Um, yeah, this is just a, a little Python script. So if I save the file, then I can um, let's open up a new terminal. Um, I'll put the file right here, I think. Yeah, so if you run this file, this is a, an interesting thing that helps you see how support vector machines work. So the right mouse button lets you put in one type of point. The left mouse button put, lets you put in another type of point. And then we let's do a linear fit and click fit, and you can see that um, that it separates them out this way. And um, the, in support vector <coughs> machines, these points that are circled right here, these are the ones that are the so-called support vectors. Because um, essentially, the reason they're support vectors is because, oops, I didn't mean to add that one. Let's uh, do this one again. Click fit. So the reason these are called support vectors is because it really doesn't matter what's happening out here, right? I can add as many points as I want out here and it's not changing the classification. But um, this one, if this one is perturbed or if there's another point added near here, then it does change the classification. So that support vector machines kind of work that way. They look for the nice separable space between these groups where they can fit a, a big region like that. So, so this, is a, this is a linear classifier. And if you guys have this open, um, Yeah, so if we put one point over here, um, that color, then things get a, get a little less um, neat, right? So you can see that it's, it's kind, of, kind of tweaked the alignment and more, more points end up mattering as support vectors. Um, but you can, you can play around with this yourself and it's, it's kind of interesting actually to see what you can do. So let me clear that out. So we've, we've been doing a nice uh, linear fit here. So we can, we can fit a linear model pretty well to that sort of data. But you might ask what happens when um, a linear model doesn't fit the data so well. So if we have something that looks like this. So in that case, uh, actually let me clear it because it was getting a little messy. If we have a cluster here and then you know, some points there, some points there, some points there. This is something that clearly should be separable, right? We should be able to find a dividing line right here. But it's just that this is not a linear problem. There's no single straight line that you can draw that will divide those points out. So in that case, you can, you can uh, make the model a little more complicated. And instead of using a little linear model, you can use um, a Gaussian model. So that's what this RBF is right here. That stands for radial basis function. So it's basically a Gaussian model to the data. And if we click fit and see, well, it's, it did, um, it does pretty well, right? So it, the, the Gaussian model fits some, it's very, very strange. It's really sensitive to these parameters right here. So if we change some of these parameters, we can see what that does. What if we do that a little? Yeah, so you, you can play around with this and, and see what these, uh, what these support vector machines do in this classification here. So one thing, if you guys have this open right now, um, one thing that's interesting is asking about how, how can you fit an XOR problem. So an XOR problem is basically like this. You have four points with... Uh, Similar, similar points in opposite corners. And the question is, can, can, this be, can this be linearly separated? Um, 
can you? Yeah, and we, we, we can see that this is not linear, linear, linearly separable if we do that. Let me go back to the hyperplanes. So basically, one, one, lin, one line doesn't really, doesn't really do much there. But if we use a polynomial kernel, for example, it's easier to see these, these types of kernels with, uh, with the surface. We can try to fit these things. So I if you have this open, there's a kind of an exercise listed on this, this sheet right here. Where, did it, where is it? So um, to play around with this a little bit and see if you can construct a problem here with less than 10 points. So you, you have fewer than 10 points total where the predictive accuracy is 50%. Um, and the accuracy is shown um, in, the, in the terminal where you, let's see if I can get these both open right here. In the terminal where, you're, uh, where you opened this, you can see the accuracy right there. So if I fit, you, know, you have some there. And that accuracy is 100%. The so do you, uh, do you guys want to play around with that or do you want to, uh, want to move on? Play? <laughs> Fernando said play. So yeah, see if you can, um, see if you can de define a set with those 10 points where the best linear model, so you're, you're clicking right here, has an accuracy of 50%. That's 80%. It starts to look really messy after a while. <laughs> so anyway, when you, uh, if, your best, if your best accuracy is 50%, that means that essentially your classifier is doing as well as you could just randomly guessing, right? So if we click over to the next section here, this is a, the, this next section is kind of practical advice, and this, this has some really useful stuff in it about um, basically overfitting, underfitting, and, um, and how you can use cross-validation and, and tools like that in order to, to understand what's going on. I'm not going to go through the details of it. If you want to, uh, if you want to read about that, you can you can check out this tutorial later. But I, I want to give you essentially a, a feeling of what it means to be overfit or underfit. So this is an example, a simple example where you have house size versus price, and the data points, the x's in all three of these figures are the same, and we're basically fitting a polynomial to this data. And we can think about that polynomial as being our, um, our function, that, our function that's, that's learning the shape of the data, right? So the number of parameters you use in the poly polynomial is, is really, really important. If you use just a single parameter, that means you're doing, um, you're basically fitting a line to this data. And you can see that this is, this is underfit. If you, were to, uh, if you were to start adding other points where this data looks like it, it is, you would have a lot of error, right? Because this line doesn't really fit the data very well. D equals two is getting closer. If you, if you added more points along here, you'd expect that they'd probably fall somewhere near that line, right? So this is kind of the happy medium. And then D equals six over here is overfit. So what overfit means is that you have too many parameters for your data. And um, for that reason, it, it can fit your training data perfectly but for example, if you added a point right here, which would make sense in light of the, the trend of the data, right? You add a point right there, that's gonna be off by a factor of you know, 1,000 from what the fit says. So um, it's really important when you're, when you're doing this machine learning stuff to, uh, to get a handle on how well your classifier is or re re regressor is fitting the data. Because um, if you're underfitting, then you'll get you'll have a lot of error when you try to predict a new sample. If you're overfitting, you can have even more error, error when you f predict a new sample. And you want to be able to land somewhere in between. So um, 
just to give you a, a preview of all this stuff, there are ways to do this with um, cross-validation, where basically you're, uh, you're plotting the degree of fit versus the error on, uh, on the test set and the training set. Um, you can use that to decide where, where your classifier is going wrong. You can plot these sort of curves with the training set size. I'm just going through this quickly, but um, you can look at it later if, if you're interested in how to apply these machine learning algorithms in practice. I'm on um, 2.3.3. Yeah, practical advice. So um, yeah, if you're interested, if you're interested in learning more about that, that's a that's a good place to look before you start applying these things to data because there's some important stuff in there. Um, but I want to go to the the stuff that I love, which is in this next section, two, three, four. Oh no. Oh, there it goes. I thought my image wasn't loading. This is, um, this is an example. So for the last, uh, do we have about half an hour or so left, 15 minutes, something like that? For the last little bit, I want to give you a chance to, uh, to actually try some of this in practice. And what we're going to do is use some astronomical data. So what we're going to look at, um, let me scroll down here. In astronomy, often we want to be able to distinguish, um, quickly distinguish between different types of astronomical sources. Um, in order to figure out if we want to follow them up or not, and you know, send a, if we want to slew another telescope over there and get more detailed information. Um, and these are some examples of sources. It might look better on your own computer screen. It's a little, the resolution's not so good here. But we have, on the left, this is what a star looks like in a picture. You see that little dot at the center of the screen. This is what a galaxy looks like, so you have this nice diffuse thing. And over here, this is what a quasar looks like. And a quasar is, um, it's essentially the, a supermassive black hole at the center of a very, very distant galaxy. And because these black holes can weigh up to about 10 billion times the mass of the sun, they have this intense amount of, of mass, intense amount of gravitational energy, and they can outshine the, the entire galaxy that they live in. So the net result is, is that you get these very, very distant objects that are way too small to be resolved and we see light from them that's about as bright as the stars um, in the far reaches of our galaxy. So in, in a single image, all you see is a little point source, just like you do with a star. So the question is, can we design a machine learning algorithm that will tell us whether we're looking at a star or at a quasar? And this is important because you want, um, if, you're, if you're interested in studying quasars, you want to be able to look out in the sky and find these and then um, use your, your rare and expensive telescopes like the, the Keck 10 meter telescope, things like that, um, and only use that time on the objects that you know are already interesting or that you know are going to be interesting with a high probability. So that's what um, this example is about. And essentially what we're looking at, the, the data that we're going to look at for each of these is the colors through um, different filters. So what I have plotted up here is, uh, this is the exa an example of a spectrum. So a spectrum is basically, this is the wavelength of light, so the, the color and very small deviations, or very small bins. And this is the flux as a function of that, that wavelength. So this is what a spectrum looks like. And if we, if we had a spectrum, this, for example, is a, is a bright blue star. It's actually the spectrum of the star Vega in, um, in the constellation Lyra. And if we have a spectrum of these objects, we can tell that we can tell the difference between a star and a quasar pretty easily. But these spectra, especially for faint objects, take a long, long time to, uh, to observe. So instead what we do is we look in these filters, in these pass bands. So you can imagine that we, we stick a filter on the telescope that has this width in, in spectral space. So essentially what it does is it, it integrates everything inside this filter and returns a sing single value. So these are the filters from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It measured in uh, the U-band, G-band, R-band, I-band, and Z-band. So for each, um, for each object, we have um, five different numbers. Yeah, all of the, all of the photometric data, yeah. And then there, there are also, um, there's a component of SDSS that also has spectra as well. But there, there's something like, how many 
you know how many photometric objects there are? There's something like eight, eight or nine million photometric objects, and um, under one million, that's more than that. It's, it's, in, it's in the tens of millions of photometric objects and, a, and about a million spectroscopic objects. So we have basically a, a data set of a million points that are very well classified, very well observed with this sort of data. And then we have a data set of tens of millions of points that have much sparser data, much, much less data, but we can, so, so we want to use, we want to use the well-observed things as a training set so that we can classify the stuff that we don't have the good observations of. So it's a well-posed machine learning problem. And if we look, um, let's, yeah, let's, let's take a look at the data right here. So um, if you are in your, Where's my stuff? Pi data astronomy. So you're in this directory um, that was on the, on the USB stick. And we have, uh, we have some files in, um, in the data file, in, in the data directory there. So let's, let's import, whoops, I need IPython, don't I? not going to play nice with both screens. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy copy this because it'll make it make it easy and you can do the same thing. So we we get our train data and test data. So train data dot shape um, this is a this is a record array. So we have 505,000 training objects and if we do train data dot d type dot names we can see the different things that are that are in that. Um, did you not put the Trojan Dragonfly in the repo? They're not. Those, those are also cloned. Oh yeah, if you not if you. Data by cloning and not by and you don't have to do a repo. Yeah, if you clone the repo, then you can go to. Um, you have to have to fetch the data. So if you go to to data, um, SDSS <laughs> colors, you can. Uh, Python fetch data, and that'll download it from my website. And I already have it, so it's there. So um, we're going to set up our training data, and for you, we can use this code right here. I'm just going to I'm just going to copy and paste it so we can get through quickly. Our Y train, our X test, and our Y test. So we have the, the training data that we're using, which is a, a four, four features. Um, the test data, which also has four features. And then we have our predicted, or our, our true observed labels, Y. And then these, these Y tests, these are um, predicted labels from, uh, from the literature. So we can compare our results with what what people in the literature are getting with more sophisticated values. So we're going to use, um, as, a, as a first step, we're going to use the naive Bayes algorithm. So this basically takes these clusters of data and says, this looks like a Gaussian, that looks like a Gaussian, and which, ga which Gaussian is the, is the test point closest to. I'm just going to run through this too. So we. We um, import naive Bayes, we instantiate our object, we do the fit as before, and we do the predict, and now we have uh, some predicted values. So, um, so if we want to if we want to test the accuracy of this, we can um, print something. Oops. If we um, if we want to type the accuracy, we can ask um, how many of these points, how many of the, the, the tested labels and the predicted labels are equal, um, and divide that by the total number of points, and we get a percentage. So the percentage is something like 60%. So this is, this is a pretty simple algorithm. It, it seems not to have done very well, but there's, there's something that um, we need to be careful about here because the data, is, the data is very skewed. It has the objects with Y test of zero 
there's uh, 180,000. And with Y test of 1, there's only 13,000. So basically what we're looking at is there are, there are 186,000 quasars, or sorry, 186,000 stars, but only 13,000 quasars. So um, just looking at the accuracy won't really tell us what's going on. Um, Yeah, in this case, we're just asking how many of the points agree divided by the total number of points. Uh, how many of the how many of the classifications agree? Um, yeah, they both say star or both say quasar. So that's just saying that the, the test equals the predicted. So one one thing that's helpful here is to look at the uh, since we have this skewed data set, we want to look at the true positives and the and the false positives, and essentially what it helps to, to compute these things called precision and recall. So precision says, um, of the things that we labeled quasars, how many of those are actually quasars? And we can compute our precision here, and we find that that's only about 14% that we've, of the things that we've labeled quasars, only about 14% of those are correct. So basically our, our algorithm is just trying to basically labeling everything a quasar almost. And, um, and it does really well on the recall. It, it correctly identifies 95% of those quasars, but that's because it's just calling everything a quasar. Right? So that's, that's where um, this precision and recall score come in. You don't really, just calculating that accuracy of 60%, you don't really see that this is the problem that's going on. So you can, um, if you don't want to do all those functions yourself, you can actually, we have this thing in, in scikit-learn called metrics. So you do, um, I'll just type it here, from sklearn import metrics. And then we print the classification report. And it tells us this. So for the stars. The stars were 99% precise, but we only get 60% of them out. So uh, every we 40% of the stars were actually labeling quasars incorrectly. Quasars were getting uh, we're labeling them most of them correctly, but we're also labeling a lot of stars um, incorrectly. So this kind of gives you a, gives you an idea of how your classifier is doing. So. Um, did you have your hand up or no? <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, basically, we, we can do better. And um, for the last little bit, what I want you guys to do is uh, click on this exercise one right here. And this will walk you through, um, this will walk you through a, a better classifier that, that's based on Gaussian mixture models. Um, so what we have here is in the um, skeletons directory. Sorry, let's get. We're right here. So, in the skeletons directory, we have a couple exercises. So, if we um, open skeletons slash exercise one, then there are a bunch of things in here that say to do. And this will basically walk this. This will walk you through the process of creating a Gaussian mixture model classifier that um, hopefully will be much more sophisticated than our Gaussian naive Bayes and do a lot better at the star and quasar classification. So um, I think we have just a few minutes left, uh, 15 minutes left. So if you'd, if you'd like to do this, if this sounds like something you want to tackle, um, you should be able to, uh, to make some progress on it. And uh, I can walk around and, and help you if you're, if you're working on that. So the way at the top of this page, it tells you how to run this. Um, you go in Python and run workspace exercise one py, and then the first argument there is just the location of the data that it needs. And it'll, it'll load all the data itself. It'll, it'll split it into the training and cross-validation sets that you need. And it's only these little places down here that say to do that um, you get to do these things. So I'll leave it to you, and, and feel free to grab me um, if you have any questions about how to implement this. Yeah.